that all men have inalienable rights to think freely, to talk freely, to write freely their own opinions, and to counter or utter or write upon the opinions of others. This is from the Creed of the Church of Scientology. Hey everybody, I'm Holly, aka the Scientology, and we are here for another interview. This time we are here with Max Howry. I hope I got that right. Um, and he is the, uh, if I, I, I'm assuming this is the right uh, role, the president of Ron's Org, an independent Scientology organization out of Europe, I believe. That's not really correct. All right, Hello, so everyone. Please help me. <laughs> yes. Actually, I am the commanding officer of our org, and we have a lot of CSing, and we are supporting other orgs, but we are not actually uh, administratively above them. Everyone, every org is actually autonom autonomous and is having their own rights, what they do, how, how they organize the, their org, whatever. So this is, I'm not the president, I'm just kind of a key figure, let me put it that way. Okay, so it's it sort of reminds me of how Scientology missions are run. Kind of, yes, kind uh, of. I mean, I don't know how they are run today, but uh, I mean, they, they the mission holder got or the mission network got destroyed around 82 that's long ago so what they are doing today i don't know all right so my first question is if you could describe it to the people who don't know what is ron's org the ron's org is actually we we started to do that uh operation in the 80s when we left the church first we were actually with the advanced ability center with david mayo and then captain bill came and he made the bronze org he organized he founded that organized that in well i think it started in 84 so it's long ago almost 40 years and it is basically it's just scientology without the church Okay, and um, I wanted to ask, what are some differences in the way that Ron's Org practices Scientology as compared to the mainstream church? That's now a real, quite an issue, yes. Because we, when we started, when we began in the 80s, we just took it over as the church was actually uh, delivering Scientology. And there was a lot of changes, 1978 up to 84, 84, uh, 82, 84 in this area. And we just took it over as it is. And we assumed Eldron Hubbard is around and alive, etc. And in the many years later, we found out something is very fishy, something is very wrong. And to make a long, long story short, we found out that the standard tech is basically from 70, 1972 and earlier, especially the briefing course. This is the main standard technology. But that was a long, long way to find out. Okay, so then that answers my next question, which was going to be which version of the volumes do you follow? But I'm assuming you completely don't agree with the 1991 compiled versions? Yes. I mean, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean there's everything uh, crap in it. Absolutely not. But you know, there are issues. They got uh, released even after uh, the death of Elron Hubbard and revised after him, and this kind of things. And we found also out, for example, New Aerodynetics is not Elron Hubbard. That brought about the biggest uh, quickie wave ever in Scientology. That was the worst what we ever, ha ever have seen. All right. Um, my next question is, so I know you helped to run Ron's organ, Grenchen. Um, how many staff members do you have there? We have six full-time staff members and we have about five part-time, six part-time staff members who help in all kinds of things. And what about uh, member counts? like just public members? Well, we don't have members. We have just actually people who come to the Ronsorg and do their service. So we don't, we are not an, uh, an association or anything like this. 
so you don't have a membership or so you just come here you pay for your service and that's it and we have about 200 to 250 people depends how we count wow in, in one location alone well, that means they are active. That does not mean everybody is coming every day. So last summer, for example, we had a lot of traffic. So we were very happy. The summer was warm and dry. So we could put the tables outside in the garden. But normally it's not that much. So, so last summer we had sometimes 30, up to 40 people here around. I was watching your um, interview with Scientolopedia about five years ago. And I Before? noticed... Uh, the the Scientolopedia website. Ah, with uh, with David. The, what who was his name? Uh, the, um... uh, I don't remember what his name was, but hang on, I'm looking that up right now just to check. David Lacroix. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I remember in that interview, you actually showed a graph of one of your statistics, and it was insanely high compared to mainstream church standards. Um, what are those statistics like nowadays, such as well done auditing hours and, and study hours? They are still very high. I mean, it's not uh, skyrocketing in that way, but they are on a, a relative high level still. I mean, they didn't decrease. So that's, we are about, I don't remember exactly how, we are, how much we are right now, but 100, 120 hours of well done auditing hours in a month and uh, similar amount of co-auditing. And for the, for the course room, we have about six to 800 in average. That means 600 means uh, one point on the statistic is two hours studying in the course room. So that means 1,200 hours have been studied in one month. That's uh, 600 to 800 points are on this. That's statistic absolutely insane. Month. That's that's crazy for me to even imagine. Any any org would be killing to have those statistics. Well, look, when I when we have been in the church back then in the 70s and 80s, I mean, I was I was in Copenhagen in training and we had 200 students in the classroom in the exact same time, you know. I mean, it was crowded. It was a huge amount of people. So I do not consider that very high, to be honest. The only reason I say that is is I more say it compared to Scientology's counts nowadays in the in the present day with their negative reputation and how the church is organized and run under David Miscavige. Yeah, fully understood, but still, this is uh, I consider this statistic by far too low, and I'm working hard to improve it really. And well, that was a long story with distribution division, you know, to work on that. And slowly, I have the impression I start to understand, and, and we have to find ways how to apply actually distribution policies in today's world with the internet, with the mobile phones and all this stuff. You know, it's an absolutely different world than when Hubbard was around. Everybody's going to want to know what originally convinced you to join the original Church of Scientology when you were younger? Oh, I was so young then. I didn't think so much. <laughs> Today, I know it much, much better. <laughs> I was 19, you know. I was so young, bloody young. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. It's good. And of course, I wanted to improve the world. I'm, I'm an idealist and so on. And that, that, was on my, that was on my line. For example, Erica, my wife, she started when she was 16. I was 19. So we were so young then. And many, many of us were very young. This is the amazing thing. We were really connected with a lot of young people around us. But it was really my, in my heart, actually, to improve condition on planet Earth in all directions. This is uh, definitely uh, a, in the goal line of me. And when, you, when did you join staff? That was in 79. Um, it was the 3rd of January, 79. And what was your post? I was not even... Well, first you start, I just studied in the first moment because I was supposed to be an auditor and I also was then an auditor. So I was actually uh, doing, I mean, I started in 78 in September, beginning of September, I started with the communication course. I was really absolutely green to the subject. And then around 
I don't remember exactly, probably April, May, I was a new aerodynamics trained and class four auditor. And then I was doing the internship, so I was trying to do the internship, but there was a big problem in those years because everybody was attested clear and nobody was really getting any auditing because everybody was just clear. Oh, so they were that doing really bad. Quickie, quickie grades and getting people to clear faster than they should? Well, a quickie would be a quickie, but that was not even that. Very often they were just attested clear and then they get, went to the OT levels. That was a horrible time. This is why I say new aerodynamics was the real big catastrophe we have had. I always say when you, when you were able to spell the word Scientology, you could attest clear. Because people came in and I was an auditor then, so the people came in really green and I had to do with them the Scientology CS1. And after that, they went to the, uh, the clear check and were attested clear. And then they, it, was, they, uh, it was said, well, if you're clear, you don't need the grades. So they had no dynetics and they had no, no grades, very often also no objectives, no nothing, you know. And then they went to flag and very often they failed. And of course we lost them basically all. I mean, we had so many, many, many people in those years. If we would have only 50% of them still today, we would be in clover. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Now, when did you first realize that, that new aerodynetics wasn't standard tech? Well, that came late. That really came late. That was probably around oh, 2000, 2005 oh, okay. or something. It was really late. Then what caused you originally to start having doubts? The main thing was what's coming actually from, the, uh, from Scientology auditing and not from Dynetics auditing. The problem we faced was, you know, in, uh, it was in 82, yes, in second part of 82, there came a new bulletin. I mean, not a, it was a revised bulletin actually and said that every command on the academy, uh, on the grades must be checked for read. And so we applied that. We all swallowed that, swallowed that down easily, you know, and thought, yeah, that's standard, that makes sense and so on. It's good. So we did it. And then we went to Moscow and we had a lot of people there. And I mean, before we were absolutely a small organization, we had just a few people on our lines. We had those days, maybe 30, maybe maximum 50 people on our lines. We were really small. And then we went to Moscow and we had a big group there and we had a lot to see us. We had a lot to handle. There were a lot of questions. And then I just realized that they make quickie grades. I mean, they check, they just go in the session, they clear the words, they check the command, and then they go to the next command. And I still remembered, you know, I made the academy in 79 and we never checked any command then for reads, we just run them. So that was basically still in my DNA. And those years I just changed in 82. And then I reviewed it and I said, so that's it. Because I was already a bit skeptical before and I skipped that or I canceled this bulletin and said, no, you run now. And they started to run it uh, with view trains. It was really, really good. And then I had to review also Dynetics. And finally, uh, there was also the checking uh, when you run a command on Dynetics, you check it also for read, you know, and then we run into very strange situations. For example, I remember clearly I had a case, then uh, an auditor called me, she was from Munich, and said she is in big trouble with her PC. She, and asked her what she's doing. Well, she said, I'm auditing a secondary on flow two, and I was in deep deep mess, you know, at PC is crying, doesn't get out and so, and I asked around what she's doing and then finally asked her, well, did you run flow one with her? And then she's, no, it didn't read. And then I said, okay, go back, run flow one, run the real secondary she received and that run perfectly. And then also what I have seen in Russia, many of them just were auditing, for example, book one, and you don't apply or you don't use an e-meter on book one and you just audit. And, and then finally they didn't run or didn't check for reads anymore. And we found out 
it runs perfectly. I mean, you need to have a charged incident or a charged item and then it runs, but you don't need to check the commands for it. And so I had to review it. And for example, but I also, what I consider the real out point in new era dynamics is the postulate. They are asking for postulate, which is, well, it's not really a big catastrophe, catastrophe to ask for a postulate, but in the material everywhere is written postulate equals erasure. So when the PC gave a postulate and end of cycle, incident is erased, chain is erased, end of it. And that's completely wrong. You erase the, the uh, incident and that's the EP and it's not the EP to have a postulate. Maybe you can have a postulate, but the erasure became actually a secondary phenomena, phenomena. And that was really, really wrong. So many such small things came and finally I canceled actually the new aerodynamics, especially also with the clear because so many people are tested wrongly clear and yeah, finally it got canceled. Gotcha. Um, you mentioned Russia, and I noticed that you guys had these these events in different parts of the world. Would you be able to elaborate a little bit more on what these events are? Like, I know, I've heard about, I think there was one you guys had in Turkey. There was a bunch of locations that you guys would have these big events. Yes, it all started. Actually, we went to Moscow in 1978, and... Russia is a big country. I mean, the people came from Vladivostok, from Irkutsk, Irzhevsk, and uh, Omsk, and all those Siberian cities, and of course from Petersburg, from Moscow, from also of course, they, of course they came from the Ukraine, from from Kiev, from Odessa, from Kherson, and whatever. And so we had to take one place, and we just rented a hotel or a school or whatever where we could meet and be together and. Did that so that was the beginning of it and sometimes we had up to 150 180 people in such a camp and we trained the people then you know we delivered courses and of course they were also auditing uh, also on the OT levels later and so that became a tradition and finally people be the Russian became a little bit more uh, wealthier. I mean, they got more money and they could afford it to go to Turkey, for example, or to Egypt. And they said, well, look, we, we take our holidays. So why not to go to a place where we have also a little bit of sea and beach and sun and so on. And so we went sometimes to Turkey or to Egypt. And now when we go to Turkey, for example, then we, we are working early in the morning and in the afternoon we have a a unit of about two, three hours where we go to the beach and then we are back to course room and to session to almost 11 o'clock in the night. Wow, that late. Oh, crap. Um, so, I mean, what about your wife? Did she end up following your leaving of the church? Because I think you told, did you tell me she was on staff or did you tell me she was 16 when she joined? She was 16 when she joined, but actually we met on staff and we, well, we didn't marry because we didn't have money. We didn't have time to marry on staff. That was just impossible to do. Then. <laughs> so, but we left the church both together end of 83 and in 84 we married. And it was also the year 84 when the free zone started to get active and i mean we went out of the church and there were so many people outside we just went to the city and we met people here and there left right and center and we started to talk with each other and finally we collected up in an organization i'm sure that the founding of the internet and and the big dot-com stuff all the websites coming out all this new technology probably made it a lot easier for you guys to find more free zone people to discuss things with and possibly get some new members to to join some new people to start going on course or taking services absolutely but that was in the beginning not the case i mean internet came about in 95 yeah then then it started but the other 10 years before we had still snail mail and we, yeah well there was the fax uh, telefax was then uh, already forgotten today <laughs> 
<laughs> so we had this one, but we had really to meet and we had to see with each other. I mean, telephone was still expensive then. And so, but for, for us, this is really true. The internet was gold. I mean, when we are, we're looking for a reference, we just could just ask people around, hey, do you have this reference? And someone has had it, scanned it, and then we have had it and we could distribute it for everyone. And that was really fantastic. Uh, so I was looking at your bridge and obviously you, you notice that it's not, it's not exactly like the church. There are, there are differences, but I, at the end of it, I did see, it said Ron knew what would happen to the church. That's why these levels are not available. The further steps up the bridge, up to the end of the bridge are called Phoenix superpower for OTs, which I'm assuming is the same. Is that the same superpower that they already have over in Flag? No, I don't think so. I'm not absolutely familiar with superpower in Flag, but as far as I know, superpower on Flag is something absolutely different. And then what about something like uh, the Grail? What, what What is the Grail? What are vast levels? Because well, these terms have me a little confused. Yes. You have to understand... Uh, the bridge in the church itself got changed many times. This is not something uh, which is stable from the very beginning. There was a bridge from around uh, 7, 65, 1970, then about 74, and then later in 1980, or, and even 78, it got changed, 1980, 82, and 82, it got basically upside down. Before, I mean, the bridge we use today from 74, this is more or less the basic bridge we use today. We have Dynetics, and then we have the grades, and in 82, or maybe it was in 81, it got upside down. You have uh, first the grades and then Dynetics. So there's many changes. And for example, when you look at the bridge from the church from 1978, you had the OT3, and then you had knots, and then you had, you continued actually on the bridge from 78 with expanded OT3, and then original OT4, 5, now uh, 7, and then uh, I mean, 40 OT7 and then expanded OT3 and then 456 and then you were full OT7. And then later in 82, 83, knots was more developed and it became OT567. And so we had all kind of breaches then. And what we have to see is actually when you go up the bridge from zero to we call it Excalibur, or you can compare it on the level with uh, knots. This is the other determinant case you handle. And the levels from OT9 to OT16, which are the levels you were just mentioning, Phoenix, Spot, I mean, Superpower for OTs and the Grail, those are the self-determinant case. Could and later... Hmm? Sorry. Oh, sorry, continue, my bad. Yeah. And later, I mean, higher and then you get into games. I mean, to the first you get into the pan determinant case and then you get into games. That's the thing. So also four, 9 to 16 is the self-determinant case, something what you have done here that the case is around. And uh, uh, from 16 to 33 or so, I would have to see it to be exact, is the pan determinant case, and then you get into games and neo games. I, uh, to be honest, I, I wasn't expecting these to be the OT levels, but I, I wasn't expecting Ron's work to have OT levels past eight, to be honest. I, I thought it stopped at OT8. I didn't know it went all the way up to 33. Yeah, that's that's we go up to forty eight actually. This 48? is true. Yeah. Oh my gosh! 48. Is there um? Where can I find this? Uh, is is there a version? Is there a chart for this version of the bridge? Um, like on the website or? No, we don't have that on the website. This is confusing the people. This is too high. Even the normal lower grade chart, it is too confusing to have that on the website. 
I mean, they, they, you, you know, you get someone new into the uh, into on the bridge, and he he can hardly confront the communication course and the live repair and some other stuff there, and then you tell him of OT forty eight, and it's just then you explain him while well, that takes 10, 20 years or even thirty years to read, then he's just overwhelmed. We don't do that. Now, when it comes to something like OT seven, where they from what I've gathered, they have those six month sec checks at flag and the, the refreshers and all that stuff. How long does the average person going through OT7 take to, to go through it in, in Ron's org? Because I understand that it can, in the main church, it can take 10, 20 years just on that level. Yeah, it's, it, it's endless in the church. It's endless. It's a money making machine and it's not an OT level. I mean, we have had people who have been 20 years on it and finally they came to us to complete it. That's too long. As I told you, originally in 78, Knotts was just a round down after OT3. And then it got longer and bigger and more round downs to it and so on. So it takes about uh, a year or maybe two years to do Excalibur, as we call it, and then you're done. So if someone, say, wanted to go through the entire bridge of, of Ron's org, on Ron's org, um, how long would you expect that to take? That's a bit difficult to estimate. I mean, it depends. You know, some people, and this is what really got lost quite often, is that when you do the grades, when you do dynetics, it takes some time. You also should get some training there. And when I tell you about, or I told you about the things, you know, when they just got a test, it's clear, and then the, the, the OT levels, it's so quick, so fast, it doesn't take time. And normally you should take, if you have a lot of money and the money doesn't play a big role and you have the time to do it, then you can go to clear with one, two years, that's possible, you know, then you can really work intensely on it, you I mean, you can come every day to the org and you can get a session, you can study and so on. That goes relatively qu quick. But when you have a job beside of it or even have children or so, it takes quite a time to get through the grades, through the genetics. I mean, sometimes it takes a year if you have not too much time to go through the objectives. I mean, we deliver the objectives thoroughly like it was supposed, you know, that takes to receive 50 hours or 70 hours and then you also give that amount and when you do that part-time, it takes time. Of course, in the church, you are supposed to do that 12 and a half hours in a week anyway, whatever yeah. job you have. But in the long run, that doesn't work. It is just, uh, after a while, you say, well, I don't have any dynamics anymore, you know. And you, I, I want just to go to, to take a coffee or you, I want to go to dance or I, I want to, to have a family party or something. And when you always have a problem with that, this is what I said, you know, when we have been on staff, we didn't have the time and money to marry. That was just impossible. You were supposed to be always in the org. And so it takes time. I mean, when, when we went to Russia, it took about 10, they were really fast. The first wave, we had there really some very hardworking people, about 50 people who were pretty quick. I mean, not quicky, but really fast because their uh, full content in life was Scientology. I mean, they were auditors, they, they were training people, they were auditing people. So they were, they were just doing Scientology. So they took them about 10 years. But normally it takes, I would say, 20 to 30 years to go through all these levels, even more, of course. And now um, when, well, since the fact that you have so many OT levels to go through as compared to the church, because I, I understand that when in the, in the main original organization that when you get to OT8, they just send you back to the bottom just to go through it again and just pay more money. So <laughs> what would happen if someone were to reach the, the highest OT level in Ron's org and then let's say they attested to it and they completed it. What what comes after? There's a lot. There's still a lot. See, the bridge is basically not just the auditing. And when many people think, well, Scientology or the bridge is just uh, going clear, going OT, being OT48. But this is not the complete bridge. Bridge has two sides. It has a training site. And this 
very well, not many have done the other side. I mean, the left side of the bridge, where you go through the training and really become a class four, a class four graduate, and finally a class eight, doing the briefing course first, you know, that's, that's quite something to study. And on top of that, we have also the green technology. And there's even much less people doing that part, you know, but that is actually, if you want to be an OT, that's OT. You know, people think OT, what is OT? They, they think about, well, then I can throw planets through the universe or something like this. <laughs> but, but that's not really OT. Uh, finally, I can tell you what is OT. Take a look at L. Ron Hubbard. He came here. He had basically no money and he put Scientology there, you know, and we are not able to do that yet. So, but that's OT. He came here. He could organize people. He could uh, teach the technology. He could organize the mess and get the mess and get the support. And what do we do, you know? Well, we put the Ronsog there. That is quite good. I'm, I'm happy and glad about that. But I'm still not there where L. Ron Hubbard is. This is what I consider OT. You know, he comes there and he talks to the people and they are motivated. They think, oh, well, that's fantastic. I have to do that, you know. Where are we? That's the point. So I, I recommend hardly and that we really study the red technology, I mean, the briefing course, for example, but also the green technology, but not only read it, but really learn to apply it. So that's so quite, you, quite an issue. So you don't, you don't want people to just focus on getting themselves up the bridge. You want to be able to have them have more people be able to help others instead of just focusing yes. on themselves. Very more third dynamic oriented and not so much first dynamic oriented. That's right. When, when you go up the bridge, once it's part of it is actually that you bring other people up the bridge, not that you only are alone going up the bridge. The thing is really to be OT, to try uh, to, to bring up the people. I mean, you cannot be OT just being alone here on planet Earth, you know, uh, the only clear and OT. Ron says, Scientology is a group activity and o uh, one OT will not make it. He needs to have other OTs to, to make it. And that's the cooperation and the, the third dynamic and fourth dynamic, which has to be organized. And we are far from it. When you look at this planet, you know, the our SPs are organized, unfortunately, too good but you see i mean i'm i'm here in europe and i see what's happening in ukraine and i see what's happening in russia you know i see with poland and all this war going on right now and i have friends of both sides you know i have ukrainian friends they have to come here or now in Switzerland because they hardly can go to Russia anymore because when they go to Russia they are considered an enemy when they go back to Ukraine and have a hard life there. I mean life threatening they could be imprisoned if not killed and vice versa a Russian cannot go to Ukraine so we have friends on both sides but they hardly can meet even when they go to Turkey they they, they are not supposed to meet because when they say, well, you have been together with Russians, you know. So where are we? I mean, we are far from uh, from having a sane third dynamic or fourth dynamic here. So we have to work hard on that. And that's part of OT. It's not OT just to, to stay alone at home happily and watch TV. So I'm assuming you guys focus more heavily on co-auditing and not yes. just a person. Okay. Now... What would be, say, someone was going through the grades and they were co-auditing with another person, what would that cost look like compared to someone who's having a professional auditor to do it? Well, co-auditing is not a big issue for in, in regard of price. You pay a little bit of CSing. That can be maybe, if you are intensively working a year, this is maybe a thousand Swiss francs or maybe a thousand dollars or something. It's not so much. But when you are getting audited, then you have to, and in our org, we charge 150 Swiss francs per hour. So that when you have 100 hours, you can calculate yourself what it costs. So that's, that mounts up to some price. Wow. Because um, I, I noticed that in the mainstream church, in, especially in America, you don't really see 
co-auditing. No one really mentions co-auditing anymore. They always are just focused on getting an, a professional auditor to do it because they want to do it as fast as possible. They don't seem like they want to be involved in, in helping other people. Yeah, that shows where we are actually as an organization. We are far behind target. We don't have a distribution division, which is uh, worth naming. So, I mean, we just don't have it. The goal would be that you could uh, organize yourself, that you get a lot of people into your org from your local people around, you know, something in a diameter of 50 kilometers or something coming to the org and see uh, each other regularly, then you can make auditing. But if you have a person in New York and another person in Chicago, this is it's too big distance, you know, and then they go to internet auditing and this kind of things. But I don't like that. I mean, you really need to be face to face to audit and training is not possible uh, at all. You need to sit to with each other you need to have the e-meter there you need to make trs and so on and that's the most important thing so this is where we have to go we really have to make classrooms and we have to make them locally in every bigger city we need an organization so since i'm i'm i don't know if you know this answer but do you know if they have any other if ron's org in general has any other like big any org openings coming up in the future or if you guys plan on trying to extend into the United States or you guys just want to focus on being in Europe? This is not a matter of where to being focused. It depends on people who would like to do an organization. Whenever a person wants to open an or runs org or an organization, we support them. We have all the materials. We, I mean, it was a big, big work to have it and to have it ready that you can open just an org and apply it. But we have it and it's possible to do everywhere. Sometimes, of course, when you go into an area where we are not... Um, where we don't have the translated materials, it's a bigger issue. But in the main languages, we have the materials. I mean, English anyway, and then we have it in Spanish, we have it in German, we have it in French. We even have it in Italian, but it's not prepared yet. And of course, we have it in Russian. And so that's a lot what we have, and you just can open it. But it's depending. Actually, it is depending to find those people who really want and can do that. Um, before we end off today, uh, that was a lot of information and um, I would absolutely love to learn more about Ron's org and stuff like that. So in independent Scientology, that's the thing I want to be able to include independent people, free zoners, as well as people who are maybe, I know that people in the mainstream church can't really talk to me, but if anyone wants to, or any former members, whatever, feel free to reach out. I just want to be able to get both sides of the story. I want people who left during Hubbard's time and after Hubbard's time, but I also want people who are still in, who still believe, and that's that's why I had William Burt Jr. on before. Um, is there anything that you may want to say to anyone who is listening, who may want to join the free zone, but maybe is afraid to, or someone who's interested in, in being an independent? I can fully agree to what you said. We have by far not enough people and we need to cooperate and we don't need to exclude. Ron said we have to include, not to exclude. And the church became a game of excluding people. You know, SP declare here, PTS declare here, and whatever, and thousands of SP declares, excluding, excluding, excluding. And this is exactly what we don't need. We need to include the people. And this heavy application of ethics in the church is just a dramatization. Well, we need ethics. I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that. But the real out ethics, what I said before when I talked about Russia, you, you see the real out ethics people, you know, I mean, people sending people in war and having banks and making robbery with the banks and so on, this kind of things, you know, that's out ethics. And this needs to be much, much focused, more focused than someone who came too late to the course room or who has an opinion which is maybe a little bit different and so on. So we should focus on our uh, common reality much, much more than on, on, than about the disagreements we have, you know. So that's 
really important and we cannot afford to lose people. This is basically it's that. Is there anything that you may want to talk about or elaborate upon that we may not have covered already in this interview? Oh, there's thousands of things, basically. I mean, maybe I can have you on again. <laughs> To, to Probably it's easier, those. yes. I mean, I'm now since uh, 45 years in Scientology. It's a long time to, to sum it up in 45 minutes. I mean, it's just impossible. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So I guess then we'll end off. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. And thank you so much to Mr. Max Howry. Yes. Which I'm trying. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being a part of this. It's all, it's good when I have a former member, but to me, it's always better when I can get someone who's still in, whether they're free zone or mainstream. So I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day and dealing with the, the difference between me and Switzerland to be able to sit down and have this interview. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I hope that one day we can, you can come on the channel again and, and we can talk about some of those subjects that we may not have covered. Yes, let's do so. And thank you for having me. It was a thank pleasure. you so much, everybody. Okay. You know the thing, go to the Discord server in the description if you want to join and go be part of the email list if you wanna get the invite to the Google Drive documentation that I have. Um, and if you want to just hit me up, you can go to scientologic at gmail.com. If anybody wants to reach you, Max, what do you, what would be the best way of contact? Oh, it's very easy. Just Google for Max Howry Scientology and then you have me or just go to the ronzog.ch and you are, you'll find me. It's very I easy. will put the link to that in the description below as well. Again, Thank you guys. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share this with your friends and family, show people that Scientologists are not a bunch of stupid crackpots who just believe in aliens because that's what everybody has an impression of. They always assume that people who join cults are stupid. And that's, that's a myth that I want to completely dispel. And anybody who joins a religious movement, they're, they're joining for a specific reason. They're not joining just because they were suckered into it. There's, there's always something that they feel that this they, the organization that they're in, whatever it is, can help to improve their lives. And if, if they want to do that, so be it. But I, I don't think we should be putting labels on it and, and calling people dumb for joining a religious movement or joining any type of external movement. That so. would be a subject, religion and church, etc. to sort that out. That's quite some misunderstandings on that. I can't wait to get those cleared up then. Yes. So, thank you so much. I'll talk to you guys later. See ya. Bye-bye. Ciao.